Well, welcome to my studio again. Uh, it feels a little anticlimactic today after finishing that uh, big abstracted piece. There's almost a tendency to want to just uh, sit back and celebrate uh, because it worked out so well and I'm really thrilled with it. But the reality is it's just another day to get back to work. So I'm going to get some canvases prepared and uh, then try and decide what I'm going to paint next. So, uh, yeah, stick around and uh, I'll get another piece started today. So I love this process of getting the canvases uh, ready to paint. Uh, for me, this is almost like a, a pre-game warm-up. So while I'm getting my canvases prepared, I'm kind of thinking about what I might like to paint. And then I'm going to get these three prepared. And while they're waiting to dry, I'll go through my photos uh, and kind of figure out what I want to paint today. Um, but as I mentioned before, I don't kind of plan my paintings out in advance. I actually have no idea what the next painting I'm going to do is. It just depends on kind of what catches my interest as I, as I kind of flick through my photos. So once I do that, uh, we'll come back and I'll actually start the painting. Okay, well I've decided what I'm going to paint and it's going to be a, an autumn forest scene, big surprise with birch trees. So here's, let me just get through so there's no reflection on here. There's the image that I'm going to be using. Um, and this really is just a, uh, almost like a brief, brief thumbnail for me to go by. I'm not going to follow this exactly, but I'm, uh, like I mentioned before, I'm externally motivated. So I usually need to see something that sparks my interest that I can then react to. Uh, that last painting that was very abstract, it was like a huge, there was a huge, um, kind of disconnect from the actual photo to what turned out. These, this style I'm going to be painting in my more typical style is kind of closer to uh, representational, but still with a fair bit of uh, artistic license in there. And I'm working on a canvas that uh, it has the gallery edge painted black. And I, I like to work on this because once the painting is finished, then I just put the hanging hardware on it and it's ready to go. We don't need to frame it. And this has been toned with fluid acrylic. You can see I have a very faint three by three grid on here. And I do that in fluid acrylic using a stubby brush just to give me the thin lines. And I have that same sort of grid on my photo here. And that just helps me landmark where things go. So it just makes it a little easier in terms of the drawing out of the painting. And I actually do the drawing out with a brush using acrylic. So I'm going to start uh, on this piece by first of all just laying out the horizon line of where where the distant hill is and where that separation from hill to sky and then I'm going to darken in this whole area that's below the horizon line. Now this piece I'm not going to do a time lapse um, I've kind of learned from experience that typically uh, time lapses work best on the big pieces um, where you can kind of see around me and I can move around the painting uh, and not block the whole thing. But anything this size, if I were to set the camera up and try and do a time lapse, we would mostly just have a time lapse of the back of my head and shoulders while I create the painting. So for this piece, um, and just in general moving forward on the small ones, I think it's going to be more effective in you know, short little real-time videos where I can explain what I'm doing um, and then jump ahead, you know, maybe an hour later and then do another couple minutes and then just kind of on and on. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the time lapses definitely do not work well with this. And the one thing I don't want to be doing is while I'm painting, um, being conscious of where the camera is and where I am uh, because 
the end of the day, the most important thing for me is to create the best painting that I can. Um, and if I have to be standing out of the way painting things because I'm worried about the camera, then the painting's going to suffer. And I don't want that. So I blocked in my horizon line. And again, kind of with the law of thirds, just this is a really nice division of space. A third sky, two thirds, kind of the distant hills. And now I'm going to block in that first major birch tree. And the big difference you'll notice between this style and that abstracted one, here I'm painting in shapes. In that abstracted one, it was all painted in lines and outlines. Um, and it's a just, it's, it's a very, very different kind of way of thinking when you're laying out the painting. It's actually more difficult with the lines because here in the, doing the shape, I can, you know, gradually increase the thickness of a shape uh, or I can get out my Q-tips and decrease it as I'm going. Um, but in that previous painting, basically I had to decide right at the very outset how wide a tree shape was by putting those outlines in. Um, so this is a little, I find this, I can kind of adjust it a little more in terms of how wide or how thick these tree shapes are. And right now I'm painting, so I should mention, yeah, I toned my canvas with fluid acrylic. Um, and it was a mix of, I think it was burnt orange and magenta, just kind of squeezed out and kind of randomly mixed together. And that's, I always tone the canvas in kind of some sort of a red. Often I use quinacridone crimson as well, but I was out of that. So I use the burnt orange with the magenta. And I'm just going to continue along here, blocking in these tree shapes. Now this is going to be mostly birch trees with just a couple of the darker hardwood trees. And as always for me, the most important thing at this stage is composition in terms of how I'm dividing the space and how these trees relate to one another. So one thing, just a simple thing, um, and I've talked about this before, you know, I want to focus on the trees getting wider as they come closer to the ground because that's what trees do. So that's kind of more a kind of accuracy in drawing type thing. But in terms of composition, I want to avoid parallel lines. So the fact that this gets closer and then comes farther away, I don't want those two lines to be parallel. Uh, and I don't want curves to be parallel. I want it to look as though they're either not going to meet each other or that they would in fact intersect if that line were to continue. And if you haven't seen my series on composition, uh, that's probably a really good place to start. And at this stage, I'm actually more concerned with the things that I don't want to happen. So I don't want to have marching soldiers. That would be where having a number of trees, you know, going in the same direction, the same size, the same thickness. Uh, that's just not interesting. So I always want to try to vary the direction of the trees compared to each other, vary the, the size and the thickness, um, avoid parallel lines, avoid tangents. Um, and as long as I can do that, if I can avoid the things that are likely to cause a compositional weakness, then any other option is usually okay and a pretty good option. Um, so sometimes painting is as much or more about knowing what not to do as opposed to what to do. Okay, and I think that needs to be a little thicker here. And I look for these kind of slight changes in direction in the birch trees. It just gives them a little bit more interest. 
And those are also obvious spots for me to put scars on the birch trees where we have these little changes in direction here, here, here. Um, and so if you are going to be spending time painting a particular motif, so for me it's trees in general and, and birch trees in particular that I end up painting a lot of now, you really want to study um, that thing that you're painting so that you understand the nature of it without having to rely on, on, on basically rendering from a photograph. Like all I'm using the photo for is just mainly the composition in terms of the, the division of space, the colors that appear there. But for the actual birch trees, I'm not painting those actual trees. I'm kind of just painting a birch tree in a similar size in similar direction to where the one appears in the photo, but these are not portraits of those trees. Where they change direction, where they have um, the scars on them, that does not at all follow what's in here because I know how what a birch tree looks like and I'm able to kind of fake it uh, and just suggest a birch tree without relying on exactly how that birch tree goes in this particular photo. And there's going, so we get one, two, three, four. I think we'll have one more birch tree. And again, I want it to not parallel this, but I want it to overlap at the bottom. And I also don't want this bottom edge to be tangent, so I want this bottom tree will come here and then we'll see a little bit of the other tree behind it. Again, regardless of what's happening in my photo, I just know tangents are typically a bad thing in a painting because it's very confusing. We're trying to depict three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. So when two things come together or come close to each other, in the two-dimensional space of the canvas, we want it to be clear where they appear in three-dimensional space. There's one in front of the other um, or the other, um, but what we don't want is to have things meet just like this. You either want to pull them apart or actually have one overlap the other, and that's generally just a good thing. Now, again, there are exceptions to every rule, and the reason that this is generally not a good idea is it's confusing, um, but I'm sure if I went and looked, I could find an amazing painting where the artist has had things meet on a tangent. Um, so all of these rules, again, are very um, painting um, specific. It's like it might actually work in a painting or it might just be for some reason a line has to go a certain way and it's a tangent. Um, in particular, if it's happening sort of out of the center of interest, that's going to have less of an impact than if it's happening right in the middle of the painting or in, in, in front of a couple of the most important elements. And I just made a little error there. So again, with the Q-tips at this stage, it is important to, for me, I believe, to correct anything that I'm not happy with, correct any errors. Um, because this is going to be the blueprint that the whole painting is going to be based on. And so if I don't like a particular shape, or I don't like the way a tree goes, then I'm going to correct it right away. So I don't have to worry about trying to do it later on. Um, and now I'm just looking for a few opportunities to put some of these smaller birch trees down here just to break up this space. And these are gonna kind of appear and reappear behind the foliage in the painting. So these are kind of further away. So in some areas, the foliage is gonna come over top of them, but where there isn't foliage, then these may peek out. Um, and, but they're not, they're not gonna go right to the top of the painting. We might just see kind of a suggestion of these tracery little branches. Um, above the horizon or may not actually go there at all. And maybe 
just a couple more of these little ones and then I'll go to the hardwood trees. But I think I'm going to uh, end the video at this point and I'll pick it up um, once I've got this finished off uh, and explain what I've done and then pick it up again as I actually start to paint the oils. Okay, so now I've blocked in um, the basic composition um, and I switched. So the birch trees were done in a dark purple. All the other trees were done in a black. Um, and it's just that it makes it a little easier for me to remember which ones are birch trees. Also, it's just a little bit less dark on there um, when I have to lighten it for the birch trees. And then the final thing that I do is kind of indicate where the sun's going to go in which in this case is kind of right on the horizon up here. And this is the stage of the painting that, as I say, it, everything kind of rests on this. Um, if, if I have a poor design, then there's nothing I can do to make the painting better. So at this stage, it's all about composition and really paying attention um, to getting things right. And then after this, the more I get things right at this stage, the more I can loosen up and be painterly later on in the process and have faith that that underlying structure is going to create um, a good foundation for the rest of the painting. So it has to work as a, just an, I think of it at this stage almost as if I was doing a wrought iron grill. Um, does this work as a design, just kind of black against red? And if it holds well there, then I can go forward to the next step. But if there's anything that bothers me at this stage, then I need to fix that and address it before moving on to the oil paint. So now I need to just wait and let this totally dry. Um, and then I will start the actual fun part, which is painting in the oils. Okay, so I've finished the whole layout here. I've put the indicator where the sun's going to be. And now I've got a, a very thin coating of the water soluble oil medium on the canvas and that's going to allow the paint to slide on. Now the very first thing that I'm going to do is quite opposite to the way most people paint and that is I'm going to do the absolute foreground foliage first. So I've got my colors mixed out on my palette and I'm just going to start painting in these leaf foliage shapes. Um, and again, one of the things that's important is rather than trying to render actual leaves the way you see them in your photograph, is to paint strokes of color that are suggestive of leaves. Um, and you get to be able to do that just through practice of doing lots, lots of painting. And so because I paint lots of Paintings with leaves and foliage, I've become pretty adept at doing strokes that are suggestive of that. And as always, I'm looking at creating certain pathways for the eye to come through a painting. And so that's going to be done first of all with these orangey red strokes. And I'm relying a little bit on my photo, more just, you know, something, whenever I work from a photo, there's something about that photo reference that catches my eye. And often it is the color and these patterns of color. So I look at that um, while I'm creating the painting to see if that's something that I want to kind of accentuate in the painting itself. And in this one, it is. There's a really nice kind of movement um, within that reference photo. Now I also have to be aware at this stage whether the foliage shapes I'm painting are in front of the branches or behind some of them. And so I'm actually going to paint some of these yellow strokes as though they're behind this foreground branch here, but in front of the birch tree. And I will just continue painting these foliage shapes uh, 
until I'm satisfied with everything kind of from the sky down to here and have all of these bright intense foliage shapes here and then the next stage will be I will move on to the sun or sorry not onto the sun onto the uh, sky but I uh, how many minutes are we at here yeah I think we're actually getting getting close to uh, the limit of how long any particular vlog should be. So I am going to stop, stop the video in a sec. Um, and then we'll come back just at the very end when I finish blocking in all of this foliage, because this is it's just going to be more of the same. You don't really need to see me doing that for 20 minutes or a half hour. Okay, so we'll stop the camera for now and we'll come back when I finish uh, blocking in the foliage and that will probably be it for today. Okay, I think that's probably it for blocking in the foliage. So again, this is done fairly quickly. That's probably about another half hour of painting since I um, turned the video camera off. And that's where I'm gonna end with it today. Um, for today's video, I'm actually going to go immediately on. The next stage for me is painting in the sky uh, and, and resolving the sun, but that'll be on tomorrow's video. So.